We have here the swimming suit that helped Michael Phelps win eight gold medals during the 2008 Olympics, the Gherkin building in London, and radars used for navigation. What do you think is the common point between these three inventions? <laughs> okay, <laughs> so the answer is indeed that these three inventions are inspired by living organisms that already exist on our planet. Uh, in fact, this swimming suit is inspired by the skin of sharks and how their microscopic structure uh, provides an advantage in water. This building is inspired by a type of sea sponge called the Venus flower basket. And finally, radars are of course inspired by how bats navigate at night using echolocation. So this concept, this idea of turning to nature when designing something that we're finding now all over the place in all kinds of fields ranging from architecture to design to engineering. Uh, this practice has a name and it's called biomimicry. Hello everyone, my name is Ghassan Aboud. I'm a senior stu student here at Collège Notre-Dame de Jamhour and I also happen to be the leader of the Biominds, a club that was created here at school last year and that revolves around the idea of biomimicry. So we've already established that biomimicry is about taking inspiration from living organisms uh, when coming up with new inventions. So it's about carefully studying how different organisms, whether plants, animals, or even bacteria, accomplish different functions and then try to imitate them or to mimic them. But biomimicry is not just a way of designing products. It's a stance on viewing the natural world. It asks questions like, how can we live in harmony with our fellow species? And how can we sustain ourselves on the long term on this planet? Now, even though the idea of inspiring ourselves from nature is not new, the term biomimicry itself wasn't coined until 1997 by Janine Baines, uh, who practically launched the entire movement with her book, Biomimicry, Innovation Inspired by Nature. So, I am no Janine Baines, so I will not stand here on the stage and pretend to tell you all about the technical nuances and details of this new way of doing things. But I'm here to talk about a personal experience and the transformative one for sure. Now, believe it or not, the first time I heard about biomimicry was when I was seven years old on this TV channel called Arte. And I remember obsessing over it for an entire month because even though I didn't really understand it, I was fascinated by the idea that nature was somehow smart and that you could take inspiration from it. But of course, I was seven. So the following week, I found my new passion that would follow me through years that was selling hot dogs on one of these moving trucks. <laughs> but yeah. Now, I came across Biomimicry again in the summer of 2020 when I got to meet this group of amazing young girls called the Beirut Biomimics and they introduced me to the methodology through a competition that they were holding. And I've been working on projects uh, ever since. Now, when I say that my experience practicing biomimicry was transformative, I mean that it completely changed the way I view the world, and especially the natural world. One particular story that I like to tell is when I was hiking with my friends in Shuwen, this uh, beautiful natural reserve in Lebanon. And that was during the summer of 2020. So as I was designing my first biomimicry project, and we're just sitting around, soaking in the sun, and this butterfly comes and lands on me. Nothing major, right? But for some reason, I didn't see this insect for what it was, which was just a pretty insect, but for what it did. I started noticing how its wings are designed in a specific fashion to produce lift, allowing it to fly while also being able to create an unpredictable flying pattern from point to point, so it could evade from predators. Then, looking at all these organisms around me, which I used to perceive as static objects for some, like trees, I started noticing how all of them were constantly accomplishing different functions. How each and every one of them was the culmination of 3.8 billion years of evolution, and how their form was a bare consequence of the functions that they needed to accomplish. So for me, that was one of the main insights of biomimicry. The idea that nature not only is, but that nature does, and that nature does with such genius. Now this graphic uh, issued by the Biomimicry Institute pretty much sums up my point. 
It's called two viewpoints of a tree. So here on the left side, you can see how someone who hasn't heard about biomimicry would look at a tree. They would consider its name, its natural form, and how they could use it in terms of wood. But then on the right side, the bright side, you can see how someone who has learned and practiced biomimicry would see the tree. They would consider what are the different functions that this tree is accomplishing, and how can I learn from that? Now, once you understand the idea that nature not only is, but that nature does, you start realizing that us humans aren't very different. Whether culturally or biologically, we accomplish different functions in order to stay alive, and we also do adapt to changing conditions. Yet, somewhere along the way, we have completely differentiated ourselves from nature. We now tend to see ourselves as superior and consider nature the enemy. And when we do think about the early stages of humanity, that is not too illogical. Because even though nature could provide for humans, it also constituted a huge danger. So we developed tools, then technology, civilizations, as a way to defend ourselves. And you can now understand why we tend to see technological progress as being opposed to nature. Just this year in philosophy class, I was learning about Georges Hegel, this famous philosopher from the 19th century that thought that you could measure the degree of progress of a certain civilization by how much it opposed and dominated nature. And the historical testament that us humans are still stuck in this idea of technology versus nature is the Industrial Revolution where we took Hegel's idea very literally and very far. But we now see where this has led us after all those years, on the brink of a literal climate catastrophe. It has now become apparent that if we are to sustain ourselves on the long term on this planet, we have to break this narrative, this story that we've built about the antagonism between nature and technology, progress and nature. And we have to go from being apart from nature to being a part of it. Because the living world has been around for billions of years. It knows what works and what doesn't on the long term. But obviously, we don't. So this is what we mean in biomimicry when we say that we need to take nature as mentor, nature as measure, and nature as model. So that means that the living world can not only provide technical insights for how to design stuff, but ethical ones and ways to evaluate our progress. And something else that working on biomimicry project has taught me is, then, is that when it comes to these insights, we do not lack the biological models to get inspired by in nature. Just think about the millions of different species on our planet and the hundreds of design principles that go into making each and every one of them. Just think about the ocean depth with I don't know how many organisms, organisms just waiting to be discovered. There is still a lot of work to be done, but then, on the, other si on the other side, consider how many of these organisms have been wiped out because of our work, and how many brilliant bio-inspired solutions we missed with every one of them. Here, I like to draw the comparison with the Library of Alexandria. For those of you who aren't familiar, this library was considered to be one of the most prominent and most ancient libraries of the world, with tens of thousands of scrolls. It was said that humanity was set back 2,000 years in the future, in the past, excuse me, because of the knowledge that was lost when it was burnt during the first century before Christ. Now, if we were to draw the comparison, humans are currently driving into extinction one million species. We are losing 3.8 billion years of time-tested, approved innovation models. That would make any sane engineer go crazy. As such, it seems that we are stuck in this vicious cycle. Our unsustainable practices lead to the loss of biodiversity, which means that we are losing more biological insights to get inspired by, which then feeds again into our unsustainable practices. But it does not have to be this way. The current history of humankind does not have to be one of doom and gloom, because again, nature is constantly providing us with the knowledge required to turn it around. As such, we can change the circle into one of abundance, into one that, as Janine Bain herself would say, creates conditions that are conducive to life. That means that we can create solutions that aren't just sustainable because 
sustaining the current model of the world is not enough at this point. We can create solutions that are regenerative and that can put us back on the right track. And of course, this is not just some empty talk. Time and time again, bio-inspired solutions have proven to be energy efficient and functional. Whether we're talking about the Shingansen train inspired by the beak of the Kingfisher that can go 10% faster using 15% less energy. Or whether we're talking about these buildings in Zimbabwe inspired by termite mounds that significantly, significantly reduce their need for cooling through natural ventilation systems. Time and time again, biomimicry has proven to yield results. And as the new generation, it is our job and our mission to lead this change. Looking at my current clubmates, I am more than optimistic because all of us are going into different fields. I'm going into biomedical engineering, I have friends going into architecture, design, even fashion, and we now all have this amazing toolbox, this amazing knowledge that is biomimicry. Now, what's the main takeaway here? I think we've all had to design something at one point in our lives. And if you're someone that deals with innovation in their job, whether you're an engineer, an architect, a designer, even more frequently so. So what am I asking you to do? Am I asking you to abandon all of your creativity and to surrender to the all-knowing God that is nature? Of course not. I think us humans have done some pretty good work so far, and you can take credit for that. But sometimes, when you need inspiration, when you need ethical insights, just step into the library and check the innovation models developed over time periods too large for our brains to even comprehend. And if this talk has truly had an impact on you, get involved with the ever-growing community of biomimics worldwide and start this amazing journey that is biomimicry. Thank you.